that's when um, you know I, we had an issue in the community where the community needed to acquire a property, uh, in particular an Islamic school, six million dollars, and my father was on the council. And I couldn't really understand why it's so difficult for a community in Calgary. And you know, we're a rich community, we're a small community, but we're a relatively rich community in the sense most of the Muslims are from Lebanon and Pakistan and the professionals are business owners. And at fundraising dinners, we collect half a million, three quarter million dollars at fundraising dinners. And yet, you know, a six million dollar acquisition was a big challenge. And being in, you know, in the advisory on wealth management side, six million seemed like peace. And, and then you know, I came to this and I told me that, you know, why don't we do this, this and that? He's like, well, no, we can't do that because that's not a core research reading up on this. And then I realized, well, everything that I've been doing over the past seven years at Everest um, isn't really right. And, and that's where you know, I, and I did more research and I realized that not another company in Canada existed like this that was being able to provide financial advice and help businesses fund using equity or Sharia principles. And, uh, and that's how we started at the Has. And at the Has, uh, for the individuals that do not know, means to unite, to bring together. And the name of the Has was to unite capital with uh, halal business opportunities. And so at the Had, you know, we have the Had Capital and we have the Had Securities. Uh, the Had Capital is the company that we formed back in 2009. And of course, education, which continues to be a big, a big challenge in terms of just bringing awareness. Uh, you know, everybody knows, you know, nobody here, if you're Muslim, is really excited to eat pork. Does anybody get really excited when you hear the word pork? No. But does anybody get too upset when you hear the word interest? Why is that? You know, how significant is the punishment or, you know, what is the importance of usury or earning from interest or paying interest relative to eating pork? And I'm no scholar and we have much more learned individuals. I can tell you, you know, interest is a significant, you know, usury, either you know, paying or receiving, then why is no one addressing this, right? So, two years later, in 2006, we launched it to have security which from that capital, which was a pool of funds that we then raised through the community primarily, uh, through both Muslim and non-Muslim investors, to invest in real estate and to invest in businesses, primarily Muslim businesses that were looking for equity. And in 2006, I relocated with my family uh, to Toronto uh, because of uh, reviving the Islamic spirit. And this is maybe a small plug for them. <laughs> I hope camp is in mind. But I had an opportunity in December of 2005 uh, to attend uh, RITS and, and they pushed me to do a booth, which I did, and I, I really, in Calgary we don't have events like this, so I underestimated the size of this event and we were, I was the only person there, and it was a three day event, and I thought, you know, we'll set up a booth and, uh, you know, I won't really have to do a whole lot, and I literally ended up standing for three days as the people and the inquiries that were walking by, they're like, the have never heard of you guys. Like, I'm not even sure if the Hab was uh, you know, just getting started. But, so that prompted me to really, you know, make the move. And, and coming to decisions, I think that was a very significant decision from my both career and from the perspective of the Hab, because now we were, uh, you know, in the, really in the Muslim community, because the GTA, uh, and I know my brothers and sisters in Calgary always don't like me saying this, but you know we have the majority of Muslims in Canada are in the GTA, and so so that's the story of it that has. And then in terms of as an entrepreneur, one of the key things that I can share with you, having been through you know several types of businesses and been in finance, is that you really know why you're doing it. And recently we just trademarked the slogan, Prosper with Purpose, which was for any entrepreneur to be truly successful, they have to be passionate about what they do. And you know, when I started at the head, and we had some wonderful mentors, and, um, and one of the mentors said to me that, you know, great, I'll support you, and we'll put the seed money in, but I need, to, I need you to give it 110%. And that means, will you, you know, leave Everest, you know, will you leave? And if you believe in the purpose and why you're doing this,
and why it's larger than you, then you'll do it. And you'll be very successful. And you look at all the uh, all the entrepreneurs that have been able to do that. Um, has anyone seen the program Dragon's Den? Mm -hmm. Okay, which is uh, uh, just to give you a short synopsis, it's where people have an opportunity, an average person has an opportunity to come and present their business idea to get funding from some very rich people who are businessmen and entrepreneurs themselves. And um, and you know, it's basically, if you have an idea, you really have to do your research, right? And make sure you're passionate. And if you have a purpose, and it'll make it easy because then the business has, uh, um, you know, it's able to, and if you just go ahead, one more slide. And this guy was on TV, Bernard Hopkins. Okay, so he's a, he's, he's a boxer, and I like martial arts and fighting and stuff, so I'm really into the stuff. So, but he was saying that it's only through taking yourself out of a, a state of comfort and putting yourself into a state of extreme or some discomfort are you going to be able to grow and are you going to be able to grow and sort of push yourself uh, beyond so I want to share with you sort of four things uh, stability so when you think of entrepreneurship you think of okay it's not really stable because I need to get a good paying stable job that's going to give me a nice benefits package and that's a nice stable life but the entrepreneur perception is, why would I do that? I'm putting all of my eggs in one basket into this board of directors of this company. See, if I have a company, I have a thousand clients. If one of them goes bad, so what? So that's the that's, uh, entrepreneur's view on uh, stability. Next slide. Okay, go ahead again. So appreciation. How many of you feel really, really appreciated at work? Okay, okay. Like Gary, some bosses are in the room or something. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> usually, usually, it's, usually it's a lot less. But um, you know, to be fully appreciated, I argue that you know, if you're appreciated and you're compensated well, next slide, you can be really happy, right? And that's what I found in terms of my instead of I know there was a session earlier called climbing the corporate ladder, but you need to build your own ladder. Okay. The next thing is understanding the system. So this is not from me, this is from uh, Richard Kiyosaki, who wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So very briefly, understand the system that you live in. So up there, E stands for employee, S stands for small business, B is for business owner, I is for investor. So everything in the E and S quadrant, they operate from a different tax law, okay, in general. Okay? And everything in the other quadrant operates from another tax law. So when people hear taxes, their brain shuts down. But really, if you open it back up, this quadrant on this side, you're working from January to June to pay the government. And then you keep whatever's left. Everyone on that side, we earn, and then we spend, and then we spend, and then we spend, and then we spend, within reason. If there are any auditors in the room. And then we, uh, and then, and then we pay taxes on whatever's left. So understanding the system is key. Uh, and once you understand the system of education, so I'm going to get back to education here. When I went to school, they focused on the top two, academic and professional, which is great. I think you got to have that. But the last two, financial and passion, such as understanding the system and doing what you really like to do, such as tapping into what it is you are supposed to be doing, I don't think the educational system really does a great job with that. Okay. So, in terms of uh, closing, you might be asking yourself, okay, so Saad's there, he's rambling on about, you know, we should all be entrepreneurs, but what does that really mean? Does that mean on Monday I gotta go set up a corporation and start a business and quit my job? No. I argue you should think entrepreneurially or intrapreneurially within that role. Maybe if you had that small business idea you wanted to do, start it on the side in the evenings. Bootstrap it like I did, right, and try to build it up, see what happens. Depending on the nature of your work, set up a company. Tell your employers um, to pay your company instead. Maybe you start playing in the other quadrant. So don't get caught uh, being that guy driving home in Ted Rogers' uh, story. So essentially, forget the corner office. Forget trying to climb that corporate ladder. And as a mentor of mine once said, you know, a life in entrepreneurship could lead you to your own independence day one day. So 
after this, you know, don't get all motivated, hopefully, and then leave and not do anything. As my coach for many years, because I'm into martial arts, beat into me on numerous occasions, go to the next slide. Right? Don't procrastinate, because procrastination is the fear of success. And that's actually him. And that's actually what he used to do on a regular basis. Don't work in your job, work on your career. Don't choose a paycheck, chase your passion. And to be a leader in business, you've got to build a ladder in you. Thank you. So, my brother Saad, I think we heard today um, some really good, insightful examples of how to prepare yourself for that business mindset. Um, we heard that from Brother Kashif, and then we heard from... Okay, by my age, you get a backache. Uh, just sitting here waiting for my turn to come, I got a backache. Okay? So, that, I mean, if that's leadership, well, you know, you're welcome to it. Um, you know, the, uh, the other thing is, that I, I want you up front, okay? Um, I have a foul mouth. Um, I say things I probably shouldn't be saying. Um, and like my children on the say, Ma, it's so hard to raise good parents. Um, <laughs> because they don't, they can't take me in polite company. Uh, because they know I'm going to swear or do something stupid and they're going to get terribly embarrassed. So don't always think that parents know what they want to do or what they're doing is right. And I have learned that. And that's why I think I am the way I am. Because I learned, my, my mentors, you're right, mentors. Mentors are very important. My mentors are Lupe Fiasco. I think it's a kick ass. <laughs> now, if you don't know who Lupe Fiasco is, you're obviously one who does freestyle rap. My 15 year old daughter, who I don't know what she does, but she doesn't talk to me because I'm part of it for her. But those are the people I learned from. And one of the things I've learned to do over, the, over, over my life is to recognize that you don't become a leader because you want to be a leader. You know what? I'm so glad you have ambitions about yourself. But you know what? You become a leader when somebody else tells you they like you and they'd like to follow you. Because you're not. Actually, you're not. You do what you have to do, and if two people like you and they join you and start to join your struggle, welcome to it, Mr. and Brother. But if you think leadership is, I'm going to go to school, I can speak in a particular way, I dress the right way, that's not leadership, that's buying favors. That's hypocrisy and buying favors. I don't want to be a leader. I never wanted to be a leader. I just got a big mouth. That's all. I'm not a leader. I'm a follower. You know what I follow? I follow a good cause. I follow social justice. I follow injustice till I turn it into justice. And I follow a basic principle in life, which is something my father taught me when I was knee high, and I had thought at that time, of course, my father, what the hell would he know? I know everything, right? That if you, um, now he, he was a religious man, so he, would, he said it in <coughs> more religious terms than I would have said it, but nevertheless, he said to hurt someone, is a, is, is a sin. But to watch someone get hurt and do nothing about it is a greater sin. Mm. And I live my life according to that. I don't stop to think, oh, can I help you? Are you a Muslim? Are you a woman? Are you a Pakistani? Are you 15 years old? No, I don't put qualifications to people's pain. If I can do something, I do it. I can't do it, walk away. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't turn around and say, I'm going to do this shit because, you know, I'm a Muslim, so I'm going to just help Muslims. Well, you know what? There's a lot of pain going around. And just take the quick, you know, if you don't realize what you're on about, you will recognize it from a simple fact. When 9-11 happened, the first call I got was from my friend, who's the executive director of the African Canadian Legal Clinic. Uh, welcome to the world of racial profiling. <coughs> a black woman. I'm like, that's a lot of you. Just the experience I was missing. 
<laughs> but you know something what that brought that was brought home to me. <laughs> can do two things at the same time. Um, obviously not good in multitasking. <coughs> but one of the things that brought brought home to me was where the hell were you when black people were being raised in profile? Where the hell were you? when Aboriginal people have been profiled on a daily basis. Where the hell are you when other people get profiled? No, you can't do wait for 9-11 before you become familiar with racial profiling. That's not goddamn social justice. That's not leadership. That's convenience. All this creativity and everything. Yeah, she's right. Creativity is not all that creative as it is made out to be. You and I are equally creative. The point is, what is this creativity for? Why the hell do you want to be creative? Who cares? Like, what, what, why? Why do you, what, you, what, 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 is, what is going to change because you became creative? You have a bigger bank balance? Thank you very much. I can sleep so well now. <laughs> you get a bigger, you know, you get a bigger paycheck, you get, have, have, get to have a fancy car, you get to live in a big home. Oh, thank you, sir. Your creativity has changed my life. Hell no. <laughs> creativity is meaningless. She was talking about thinking about things differently. Yes, but it's not a technical issue. I'm crazy at my age. Look at the way I am. I can't even stop still. I move around, my children get embarrassed because I'm so animated. But one thing I'll tell you, my kids don't need training and empowerment. They see it on a daily basis in their lives. Not because I'm so great I got up one day and I said, let me do some leadership training so I can be a leader. Hell no. It's because I realized that as an immigrant, as a woman, as a woman of color, and as someone who had certain advantages in the society because I can speak English language in a way better than white people can, or maybe not, but at least they understand it, because I have a public persona that is much more acceptable to the mainstream population than maybe somebody else, that I need to do something about it. What's the point of having these advantages if you can't do something to change somebody else's life? You know, the problem with all of us is that we walk around in this capitalist environment as these isolated, glorified individuals, and if it matters, we are historyless, we are unconnected to what is going on in the rest of the world. We're living in a country like Canada, which is a terrible pluralistic society, and we think we invented social justice when 9 11 happened. I mean, like, <laughs> excuse me, last time I heard Canadian history is based on two highly, highly racialized incidents of oppression. One is transatlantic slave trade, and the other is the genocide of Aboriginal people. So don't tell me the 9 11 made you aware of social justice. I think it illustrates commitment very well. There's a chicken and a pig walking down the street, right? They see a sign that says, ham and eggs for $3.99. So the chicken goes to the pig, you know, let's go. It's cheap. Well, the pig goes, well, you, for you it's just a contribution, for me it's a commitment. <laughs> Get it? That's what you've got to ask yourself. Are you making a commitment? Which means you may have to lay down yourself. Or are you making a contribution? Because contribution, last I heard, was only for your benefit. Commitment may be for larger benefits because you'll be the last person who benefits from it. So don't get carried away by the fact that now that you've gone through a leadership summit, you've become leaders. No, all you have become is aware. That's what I'm saying. You with the actor, right? Conflict dynamics. That's what he talks about. And it's not that I'm not going to go by myself a little pinky, you know, by a little diamond. I just want you to know, I want you to be aware that when you buy a diamond, 
There is some child killing off a whole village in Angola, Sierra Leone, where the diamonds come from. That's what I'm saying. Deep into your soul and finding out a couple of things. Are you being honest? Are you being self-critical? Are you complicit in somebody else's pain? And if so, do you have the honesty and the integrity to not only stand up and own it, but to actually do something about it? Are you willing to go over and beyond contribution to commitment? Are you willing to say to yourself, I may not benefit from this, but at least somebody else will, and that somebody else doesn't have to be your mom and dad and your brothers and sisters and your friends and your family and your community. Can it be just another person who is in pain? Are you willing to do it for a Jew? Are you willing to do it for a Hindu? Are you willing to do it for a black person, for a big person, for a Russian? <laughs> Point is, you've got to be honest with yourself. And I know I'm in your face. And you may turn around and say, man, never invite that woman again. That's okay. <laughs> there are six million people in Toronto. They still haven't found out about me. Poverty rate amongst white Caucasians went down by 28%. But amongst racialized people, it went up by 361%. You know what? If you get two meals a day, consider yourself lucky because I know people who don't. Do you know that food banks right now are overwhelmingly being accessed by people who at least have one post secondary degree? They're too ashamed to let you know. The problem with immigrants is, unlike, you know, I don't know about Canadian government thinks we come here because we want to live in the luxurious, luxurious lap of welfare. Well, I hate to tell the government, welfare sucks. It's not luxurious. As an immigrant, it's not great ambition on my part to come all this way to live on welfare. In fact, it's just the opposite. Immigrants and racialized people are way, way too embarrassed to tell anybody what is happening to them. The fact that their skills are not getting translated into skills commensurate employment, the fact that their standard of living is going down, the fact that they are feeling demeaned and their children's future is not what it used to be because they used to do better and now they are not. This is, this is the common trend that I see as I do my work with immigrants and refugees in the past 18 to 20 years. You need to get involved with children who are in school, I, you know, who can't make it to university, not because they're not bright enough, but because the cost is prohibitive. Because high schools are not preparing color, you know, kids of color in such a way that they can actually access high school education. Where Safe Schools Act was being used as a punitive device to suspend black kids. Those are the kind of things you need to look at. You need to look at how the connection between race, immigration, and refugee status, class, is all coming, and poverty is all coming together.